Well, last week we covered a lot of ground, didn't we? And this evening it's still BC 457. And I thought by way of recap, we would just go over some of the things that we went through last week so that we can flow straight into this evening's subject. If you remember last week, we looked at Ezra, the same Ezra, which was a ready scrub, one who was diligent in his work, one who had set his heart to understand and to preach and to teach God's word. He was vigilant and he was very expedient. But when he arrived at Jerusalem, he was shocked and horrified to find out that there was an apostasy in place. But the beautiful thing about Ezra is he didn't point any fingers. He knew that the house of God is the responsibility of each and every single member. And so it is that he sets about praying to his God. And he includes himself in that prayer as a person that's responsible and also accountable for the things that are going on in Jerusalem. Because he's part of that house or that ecclesia. And he would have been encouraged when he was approached by a remnant, a remnant who were those people who trembled at God's word. And when we looked at the contemporary record of Malachi, which his ministry ran from BC 500 to BC 460, Malachi makes mention of this remnant that were in total disgust of what was going on. And they spoke about it to each other and they encouraged each other. They uplifted each other to make sure that they don't go down the same road. And we see that also Ezra, being a ready scribe and being absolutely a fay and totally in tune with God's word and with the law. He brings out the principle that we were bondmen. We were in bondage, he says, to Egypt. The same way that we in 2017 were in bondage to sin. And only through the saving name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were actually redeemed and taken out and given a hope and a faith and a life that we can look forward to. But he brings us out beautifully because he says that we were brought out and God has given us a reviving to set up the house of our God. And so it is that he actually doesn't make direct mention, but the wording that he uses is in relation to the, the exile that was taken place in Exodus when the nation of Israel came out from under the thumb, as it were, of the Egyptian power. And it would have been very common knowledge to Ezra he would have taken courage in the words of Joshua, but he would have also known that it was his responsibility, the same as it is recorded in Ezekiel 33 with the watchman, that he had to, at all costs, bring these people to re the realization that they were sinning grossly against the Most High God. And we look at Joshua chapter 7, a uh, prime example is the children of Israel committed trespass in the cursed thing for Achan. Now, this is one individual that took of the accursed thing. But look at what verse 
10 and 11 says, And Yahweh said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have even taken of the accursed thing. Now, as it was become apparent to everybody, it was only one particular individual that had actually done this. But Israel is brought into it as a community because we are all collectively associated and we're all collectively involved and affected by whatever happens in the ecclesia. And actually, Paul picks this up beautifully in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 6 to 8, which in fact was the chapter where there were some very unsavory things happening in the ecclesia at that time. And he says, your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. And he goes on to say that we must not practice with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And I believe that is what, although Ezra didn't have this particular record in front of him. He would have seen through the our faith because he would have known through the writings of Moses speaking and looking forward to that time when the Messiah would come, when he, the Prince of Peace, would be established in that temple which was now full of corruption and abomination. In fact, Jeremiah brings it out as... I did last week when I said that were they actually ashamed and concerned and thankful for the deliverance that God had given them in that Haman was put to the sword and hung on the gallows? Look what Jeremiah says. For from the least of them even unto the greatest of them every one is given to covetousness and from the prophet even unto the priest everyone dealeth falsely they have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying peace peace when there is no peace were they ashamed when they had committed abomination nay they were not ashamed at all neither could they blush so you can see this was <coughs> A very, very dire situation that was in Jerusalem. And although we don't read the record, in, within the record of Ezra, just to what extent this absolute abomination was going on in Ezra when Ezra arrived there, because the main point that was highlighted by the princes that came to Ezra was the fact that the people of the land were partaking of the abomination by taking foreign wives. But we saw within the contemporary uh, writings once again of Malachi that there was a host of different things that the people of Israel were doing. Sadly enough, sadly enough, not only did they not actually recognize it, even when it was brought to their attention, they decided to totally ignore it, in fact, to question God as to whether he was right or wrong, because in their eyes, they weren't doing anything wrong. And so we pick up again where we left off, and we look at verse 11 and verse 12 that we looked at tonight. And it's actually quite incredible when you look at just how Ezra structures this prayer. What he does is he looks out and puts his hand out and takes selective words from all over the law of God to emphasize to the people just how wrong they were. Just take a look at it. <coughs> Unto the land which thou goest, 
to possess it. It's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 5. An unclean land, Leviticus 18.25. Abominations is in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 9. Fold it from one end to the other. Talking about the land. It's 2 Kings 21 verse 16. Look at verse 12. Give not your daughters unto their sons. Deuteronomy 7 verse 3. Seek not their peace or their wealth. Deuteronomy 23 verse 6. That ye may be strong. Deuteronomy 11 verse 8. And that you may have the good of the land. Isaiah 1 19. And that it is an inheritance to your children forever. Ezekiel chapter 37. The chapter of the valley of the dry bones. So what Ezra did was realizing the dire situation that he was in and indeed the people and indeed the house of God. He mourns before the people and he prays and he cries and he casts himself down. If you, and if you take a look at uh, verses, just verses 13 to 15, there's some cr incredible detail in here. It says, and after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. You see, because he was so astute in God's word, he would have been totally familiar of the goodness and the severity of God. He would have been totally familiar with the fact that God says that if you do and keep my statutes and my commandments, you shall inherit the land and you shall have it forever. But if you don't do this, then I will bring a sword against this land. And the moment Ezra saw what was going on, that was like a hammer in his head. Because he saw the writing on the wall. Look what he says. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Would not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? He knew where this was leading to. And this is why for, for Ezra, it was as though somebody had died. That is the language that is expressed there. He was mourning. Mourning because he could see the house of God and the people that full it there coming into an abrupt end. But the most important words are in verse 15. O Yahweh Elohim of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespass, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. You know, there's a remarkable structure in that verse, and I'm going to show you. It consists of two sentences and two support structures. I've labeled them 15a and 15b. Just take a look at what he says. O Yahweh Elohim of Israel, thou art righteous. What is the support for that statement? The support for that statement is, for we remain yet escaped. The next sentence he says is this. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses. And the support for that is, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. And you know, on face value, you'd almost be inclined to say that's a contradiction in terms. Because he's saying, we stand before you in our trespasses, but then he's saying, but we cannot stand before you because of this. But what he's saying is this. He's saying that, because you are righteous, God, we cannot stand before you with this. And he's saying that 
we have been delivered and you've been kind enough even because of our transgressions and because of our sins and you've brought a remnant and delivered us but now we can't stand before you because the abomination is so great and if you think I'm stretching it I just want to show you what those words actually mean in verse 15 The word cannot is actually the Hebrew word chayin. Now what it means is this, is that it can be used absolutely with no suffixes and not in a construct chain. So when the word, when used like this, the word signifies non-existence. So what does that mean? Well, the theological word book of the Old Testament says this, that the same word chayen is basically a negative substantive used most frequently in the construct form. The word, therefore, has no single meaning and the exact translation must be determined in each context. In other words, every single time it's used, it can be used to portray a totally different outlook on the actual phrase or sentence that it actually is incorporated in. However, here's the interesting part. The negative concept is always present when the word is used. It is characteristically used to negate a noun or noun clause. So, it's there to negate it. In other words, to make it non-existent. What noun was it making non-existent? Stand. So it's saying to you that you cannot stand before God because of what was going on. Look at the word stand is. It's the word amant. And it can have a non-theological meaning as simply to stand on one's feet. But it's also into a frequent idiom in the Old Testament is to stand before Yahweh. In other words, in Yahweh's presence. Those who stand before Yahweh are an exclusive group such as prophets and priests. And often the situation requires preparation for the privilege of such access. The, the third one is discriminating between true and false prophets depending on whether the prophet has stood before in the presence of God. In other words, it's saying the difference between a true and a false prophet is whether the scripture and the circumstances that you are involved in allows you to actually stand before Yahweh. And what Israel was saying to the people is, you have negated your privilege to stand before Yahweh. You know, in 1 John chapter, five, uh, chapter 1, we read that God is light. And we saw that when Ezra left and uh, um, when he left uh, the place where he was actually having, um, having fellowship with his brethren that he'd taken out of Babylon. And it says there that if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and the truth is not in us. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with the other. Here's the interesting point. What Ezra realized is that the abomination in the town and the city of Jerusalem was so great. And because the people were so diverse, the chances of him standing up in one swoop and educating them all was not going to happen. Something dramatic had to happen. And so what he did by sheer example and by the very words he uses, and he prays to Almighty God publicly so that everybody could see him. What he was trying to do was portray and distill in them a desire for those who had a 
even the slightest idea of Scripture and to realize and to absorb and to understand exactly the magnitude of the sin that they had done. And within that, they would possibly repent. Because what he actually said to them was this, within his prayer, the putting away of your wife, taking strange wives, separating yourself from God, are all encompassed. They are closely associated. Because the taking of the strange wives wasn't the cause, it was the result. They put the wives away and then they took off the strange wives. And in so doing, God said, I hate that. So what Ezra is actually saying is, you've got to get a solution to this problem. And what Ezra was actually saying is, until that happens, we cannot stand before God. In actual fact, what you're saying is, we are a fellowship with God. That is what he was telling them. Just look at what he does. And when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, they assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept sore. It was exactly what Ezra was hoping for. By pure example that he was showing and portraying his absolute agony because of what we have done. Even though he wasn't directly involved with it. He was telling them, this is what we've done. And he was praying and casting himself down and crying. And the people would have watched and they would have related to it. And they would have started getting involved with the emotion thinking about it, discussing it between each other. What does he mean by this? Yes, this is what it says in Scripture. This is what it says in Deuteronomy. This is what it says in Exodus. And bang, bang, all of a sudden, the penny drops. You know the interesting thing about it? Why I believe that to be so true? The solution doesn't come from Ezra. The solution comes from Shekaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We, straight away, they've taken on. It's not anymore you, you, you. We, can you see how infectious that is? We have trespassed against our God. We have taken strange wives of the people of the land. But, Yet there is hope because our God is a forgiving God. Do you think that it's any coincidence that Shekinah came? Look what Shekinah's name means. Inhabited of Yahweh. One of Yahweh's people with whom he is pleased to dwell. His father, Jalil. God saves. He lives of God. By the mercy of God, Yah shall save alive. Do you know what the name Elam means? The name Elam, the name Elam means hidden time, eternity. Or eternal life. So we've got Yahweh bringing someone who he's pleased with to bring about a situation where the children will be saved so that they may have eternal life. I don't believe in coincidence in Scripture. It could have been anybody else. And that word hope is actually the word steadfast endurance with great expression of faith. It means enduring patiently in confident hope that God will decisively act for the salvation of his people. That's from the theological word book of the Old Testament. What is faith? Romans 11 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This was something incredible happening here. 
that a man comes up and says, we've all sinned. And it's only one solution. Look what he goes on to say. Now, therefore, Scripture always uses a double word when it's emphasized. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God and put away all our wives and such are born of them according to the counsel of my Lord. And he's referring to Ezra there. There's a bit of discrepancy within the Hebrew that where there was actually the word Yahweh, but it is actually referring to Ezra. And of those that tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Ezra, you know what the law says. That's what we're going to do. And then he goes on to say to Ezra, Arise, don't lay there. You've got through to the people. This matter belongs unto you. Pick it up and run with it. We also will be with you. Be of good courage. Do you remember those words? When Joshua entered the land? Be of good courage. And do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word. And they swear. And then Ezra rose up from before the house of God. And he went into the chamber of Jehonan, the son of Eliashib. And when he was come thither, he did eat no bread, nor drink water. For he mourned because of the transgression. He mourned. For the transgression of them that had been carried away. It's very interesting. Prior to that, prior to this, it was about the exiles. He changes the phrase. Those who had been carried away. He's telling us that if nothing is done about this, that's exactly what's going to happen again. They are going to get carried away. And God will send lions out to take them. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captiv captivity that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. And whosoever would not come within three days According to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Can you see what's happening here? They knew, Ezra knew, and he was telling them that they are of fellowship with God because of this. So what's the thing to do? Correct the problem. If they're not going to come, and if they're not going to repent and forsake for of the things they've done, then we will disfellowship them, and we'll get on with our life and correct our life with God. But it doesn't stop there, you see, because then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together to Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month on the 20th day of the month. It's fascinating how the actual words are given to us. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God. They didn't go inside. They were in the courtyard. And they were trembling. Why were they trembling? This had not happened to them before. Most of them were totally unfamiliar with the fact of trembling. I'll tell you why they were trembling. For what they had done and for the great rain. This was no normal rain. This was the rainy season, by the way. 
They would have been totally used to rain at this time of the year. But they are terrified because of this. You know, God uses rain and uses water in the most astounding ways. He uses it for blessing and he uses it for punishment. Do you remember Elijah? When he goes and it's Ahab and he gets them to bring all the prophets of Baal and they make the altar and the prophets of Baal cry all day, oh Baal, hear us and nothing happens and Elijah mocks them. Peradventure he's a god. Maybe he's sleeping. Maybe he's gone on a journey. Maybe he's not listening and he can't hear you. And after they couldn't get it right, he tells them to get four jars. He tells them to pour it all over the sacrifices. And he tells them to do it a second time and a third time. And then he prays to God. And when God's fire comes down and consumes the whole altar and all of the sacrifices and laps up the water, then he gets the prophets of Baal taken and they put them to death. And after that, when he's sitting up on the hill, he says, Go, for there is an abundance. There is the sound of an abundance of rain. That's the blessing. And the cursing. The cursing was against the prophets of Baal. The blessing was to bring uh, water back on the land. And what about Genesis? When God looks upon man and behold, the imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continuously. And he says, I will destroy man with the earth. And he brought upon the floods. You see, it's about repent and forsake. Look what it says there. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto Yahweh God of your fathers and do his pleasure. In other words, that word pleasure is make him delighted. And separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Three times that word and is used. It's the, word, it's the Greek Hebrew equivalent for kai. It wasn't just a case of make a confession and do his pleasure and separate yourselves and. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. But then they say, But the people are many, and it is a time of much rain, and we are not able to stand without. Neither is this work for of one day or of two. For we are many that have transgressed in this. You know, the interesting thing is they would have been sitting out in the courtyard. It was that time of the year when there was a lot of rain, but this was an unusual rain. This was a rain of such magnitude that they immediately associated it with the judgment of God. In fact, the Tanakh says this, that it was a fierce storm. And they would have been sitting out there. And the interesting thing about Jerusalem at that time of the year, not only was it wet, the temperatures plummet. But they sat outside because they were trembling. Let, our, let now our rulers of all the congregation stand and let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at the appointed time and with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof, until, there's the confirmation with the storm, the fierce wrath of our God 
be turned because of this matter. God's wrath was to turn from them only when they had done it in accordance with his word. In the last section that we actually told about, besides all the names of those who had actually committed this abomination, and with a little added juicy bit at the end that Ezra then finds out that there were those who had children through their strange wives. We read of in Ezra chapter 10 at verse 16, And Ezra the priest with certain chief of the fathers after the house of their fathers, and all of them by their names were separated and sat down in the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. You see, there was an urgency. This was the month Nisan. Previously, the month Abib, within the pre exilic period. And we're not told anything more. Because this is Ezra chapter 10. From here on, it goes silent. And then suddenly we jump eight years into the future. We jump down to BC 445. A period where Nehemiah would be standing within the court. And it's this Nehemiah that has a very sound understanding also of God's word. But it is a time where he is also stricken with anxiety. And you'll wonder why I've put Ezra chapter 4 back up there. Do you remember in the first talk, we looked at Ezra chapter 4, and it says that, in the days of Artaxerxes, and I explained to you that it was impossible for it to have been in that time frame because Artaxerxes, who is the son of Exerxes or Ahasuerus, and he came into power in 464, BC 464. So we are told that there is this Reham the commander and Shimshai the scrub Within the time frame of Artaxerxes, who is the current king with Nehemiah, who sends Reham the commander and Shimshai the scribe to Jerusalem because they send him a letter and say, listen, O great king, these Jews that are here, they fortify in the city. They're notorious for rebellion. They've had great kings that have come out of them. And we can tell you that if these walls are completed, they're going to rebel. And then you'll get no revenue from this area. And all it's going to do is make your life a misery. We would strongly suggest that you look into the archives and see if it is true that these people are rebellious people and are a rebellious city. And you will find it to be true. And then Artaxerxes comes back to them and says to them, I've looked through the archives, and yes, you are correct. Therefore, give you now commandment to cause these men to cease that this city be not builded until another commandment comes, uh, shall be given from me. You see, and that's the beauty of God. Nehemiah was the chief cupbearer. He would have been totally across everything that came in. He could possibly even have been there when the letter came from Rehem the commander and Shimshai the scrub. And it is that is why he is so anxious to find out what is going on with his people. Because we read still in Ezra chapter 4 and verse 20, 23, And when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehem, 
doesn't say commander, but that's what it says in the Hebrew. Before Reham the commander and Shimshai the scrub and their companions, that they went up in haste. They couldn't wait to get there. Oh, perfect. But they went up to the Jews and with power and with force. And I believe that is totally ransacked beat up everybody, smashed the wall, smashed whatever work had been done, came to a halt, and they were going to make sure that the city was not going to be rebuilt. And so it is that Nehemiah would have been aware of what was going on there in the holy city. He didn't have all the facts. All he had was a hint of what had been commanded by King Artaxerxes. And then it's a waiting game. What is happening with my people? Will there be another time where an opportunity will arise where I can get the king to send another commandment from him that the work resumes? Because it is, isn't it interesting? He makes a decree, and for the first time in a decree, he gives it out. He doesn't say it cannot be reversed. He puts in an out clause. He says the work will stop until another commandment comes for me to reconvene. Quite incredible. So it is in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Nehemiah that it came to pass in the month Shizlu. In the twelfth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came. He and certain of the men of Judah. And I asked him, can you just imagine this? Can you imagine the anxiety that was there? What's the first thing he asks? Question, why was Hanani coming back? If they were at Jerusalem, maybe it's because of the absolute dire affliction that there was inside Jerusalem. Look what he does. I asked him concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity in concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of, the, of Jerusalem is also broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard those words that I sat down and wept and mourned. Same wording as Ezra. Certain days, remember those words, certain days he mourned. And he fasted and he prayed before the God of heaven. Just look how beautiful this prayer is. We'll just skip, we'll just go through it relatively quick. And I beseech thee, O Yahweh, God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let now thine ear be attentive and thine eyes be open that thou mayest hear us the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commands thy servants, Moses. Remember, I beseech ye, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you ab among abroad among the nations. But if ye turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though they were of you cast out unto the utmost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and I will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. That was the fear of Ezra. He knew with the abomination that was going on, there was a possibility there was going to be another 
dispersion. And now he says, These are thy servants, thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Yahweh, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who fear thy name. He said, we tremble and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. There's a random statement. Mercy in the sight of this man. Why are we being told it's in the sight of this man? Well, he then goes on to say that for I was the king's cupbearer. So, question brothers and sisters. How long do you think Nehemiah prayed for? It says he prayed for a certain time. Well, I can tell you, he starts in the month Sheslu. And he finishes in the first month, which is the first month, which is a bib in a pre-exilic. And in the post-exilic, it's the word nisan. He prayed for four months. Day and night. Now just imagine. Just imagine how we would feel. When we are praying for God. Praying to God. We are absolutely distraught about something. For a brother or for a sister. Or for a problem in the ecclesia. Or anything. When days turn to weeks. And weeks turn to months. How long will it be before we start losing faith? Before we start thinking that God isn't listening to us? That's how long he prayed for. Four months. So when we actually think about this cupbearer, and we'll, there's a bit more of this coming shortly, we just have to consider some of the things about a cupbearer. It was an extremely dangerous thing to come before the king, as we've learned from Esther. That's the first thing. You don't just walk in unannounced, even if you are the cupbearer. You walk in, and if he raises the golden scepter, you're in. It was a position that required trustworthiness, attention to detail, and dedication. Do you know why I've said that? Because it was his job. His job to make sure that every glass of wine that was passed to the king had no poison in it. Imagine a job like that. It's like Russian roulette. You could smell it. Some of them are odorless. Some of them are tasteless. You sip the batch. Hey, presto, half an hour, I'm still alive. Good to go to the king. Think about this. Do you like a job like that? He was always at the king's side. He was privileged to be at important meetings, as we'll see a little bit further on. He was asked for advice. He tested all the wine, all of it, to make sure. You've got to remember that insurrection, skullduggery, coup, you've got to remember that assassinations, poisonings all of it was rough during those days nobody trusted anybody in fact it was Xerxes himself who actually poisoned one of his own brothers to get the position so he was well aware of the dangers you sure that wine's okay yep okay I'll take your word for it and one it was a very very influential position just how influential was his position? To find that out, we're going to look at three characters in the Bible with very strange names. Reb Saris, Reb Shechai, 
and the other one is Reb Mach. Reb Shacher is pronounced, that's actually spelled, uh, pronounced, is Shacher. Now, what's so interesting about this? Well, first of all, we are told that the king of Assyria, this happens to be Sennacherib, BC 701, they come from Lachish, and he sends a huge army with these two characters. And they come to Jerusalem. And when they're there, what happens? Rab Shachar said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? But if you say unto me, We trust in Yahweh our God, is not that he whose high places and altars Hezekiah hath taken away? So what are you asking in your head right now is possibly the fact that what in the world has this got to do with our subject? Well, I'll tell you what it's got to do with our subject. It's because there's a common denominator in all three names. And that is the prefix Rab. R-A-B. You know what it means in Hebrew? It means chief. Do you know what the word Shacher means? Cupbearer. So, what we have is we have Rab Shacher, who was the chief cupbearer. Did you notice there was a word prior to that, the word Tartan? Do you know what that means? Only until recently, they thought that was the name of a person. They've now found out that it's a title, and it means the chief of command. So it's like saying, the President of the United States of America, Donald Trump, Tartan, Rab Shacha. The chief cupbearer was the commander-in-chief of the army. That's how important the job it is. The word Rab Saris, chief, eunuch the word rab mag is the word chief magi or magician so whenever you see the word rab in f in front it is not always spelt specifically like that but if you look in the hebrew that's exactly how it's spelt so this cup bearer and there's no proof to to say 100% that Daniel was the chief cupbearer, except for the fact that being able to go on an expedition to Jerusalem for a long duration of time sort of strengthens that. And when it says that he went back to Shushan to sort out a few little idiosyncrasies and things that have been going on in his absence. So the question is then, Nehemiah about them. You think to yourself, oh, what am I saying? He's one of those armchair worshippers? No, just a few questions that arise. Why didn't Nehemiah actually go with Ezra, which was a few years prior? Well, from the map you'll see, you may not be able to see it as clear. You've got Shushan. There's a there, Shushan. All right, Shushan and Babylon. So there's a strong possibility that the word and the invitation didn't actually reach Nehemiah. But there's another thing. Was Nehemiah a eunuch? It's a possibility he was. You wouldn't know why. Because in all men that had leading positions within an empire, specifically when there were women involved that would be around the woman, and also that had to be trustworthy, most of them were, un were eunuchs. And if he was a eunuch, that would have been the perfect reason why he didn't ch take the opportunity to go with Ezra. Because he knew Ezra was a ready scribe. He knew Ezra was going there to set up the worship in the house of God. And guess what? 
Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 1 says that a eunuch's not allowed to go into the house of God. So he waited for his opportunity. And also Ezra the scrub. A strong possibility that Ezra the scrub didn't quite actually feel totally comfortable with the fact that it, uh, Nehemiah was working as the king's cupbearer. So just a few more slides which proved for me absolutely eye-opening. Because it says that it came to pass in the month Nisan. Remember? He started praying in the month Shizlu. He prayed night and day. Four months later in the month Nisan or the Hebrew month Abib. In the twelfth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time said in his presence. And the king asks, Why is thy countenance said, seeing Thou art not sick. This is nothing but sorrow of the heart. Then I was very sore afraid. Why do you think, brothers and sisters, he was sore afraid? Why do you think? Well, because you would think that, well, the king obviously is quite emotional towards him. He's got feelings. But not actually 100% true. Remember I told you it was a very suspicious environment. You crossed your T's and you dotted your I's and you make sure that everything was ship shape. Otherwise you didn't survive as a king. Now there's two words there. Sorrow of heart. Rua lev. The word ruah, which is the word sorrow, it only occurs 19 times in Scripture, the entire Bible. And guess what? The only time it's interpreted sorrow is here. All the other occurrences, it's recorded as boldness, wickedness, naughtiness, evil, evil, evil. It's the same phrase used in the Hebrew when David and it was a youngster comes to his brothers and they're standing and who is on the far side? Goliath the giant. And he asks questions relating to Goliath. And his brother says, I'm not happy with you being here for I know the naughtiness of your heart. In retrospect, what it's saying here, brothers and sisters, is this is that King Artaxerxes, for a brief moment, interpreted that it may be an ulterior motive for this. And then it says, The king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? And then it says, so I pray to the God of heaven. And this is the interesting part because you can read most commentaries and most commentaries say, well, this is the particular aspect of Nehemiah. He had become so much uh, uh, a fire with God's word that he had one of his instantaneous prayers. I don't believe that. I believe when you pray night and day for four months about to your God, Asking him for the deliverance. Asking him for the opportunity to put before the king. What are you expecting? You're expecting and being patiently waiting in faith for something to actually come about. I believe the mom the king said to him, What dost thou make request? He would have said, Thank you, Yahweh. That's exactly what he would have said. He would have thanked God for the opportunity. And here he goes into the exact same phrase as was with Ezra and with Esther. 
if it please the king, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. Very clever, very, very clever statement. Because in those times, the sepulchers were very highly revered by kings. So he uses the word, he's saying, I've got to go back and protect the dead. This is the last slide, you'll be pleased to know. But here is where I, once again, would like to emphasize to you the absolute importance of the fact that this entire story of Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah is not concurrent, it is sequential. Because take a look what it says. And the king said unto me, and then all of a sudden, like a bolt of lightning out of the blue, in parentheses, the queen also sitting by him. For how long shall our journey be? And when will I return? Full stop. What did he say? Because straight after that, so it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. He didn't give a time. And I'll tell you why. Because the word queen is actually the word shichal. It's only used two times in the entire Bible. Here, yeah? in Psalm 45. It doesn't mean queen as you think of it. It's not the common word used for queen. It means a consort. So what a strong say that is. It says the wife or the widow of a wife. Hmm. Okay. So this was a previous king's wife. And the king had died. That's what it's saying there. So what does the Harper Collins Dictionary say? It says it's a woman or a sovereign, a consort or wife of a king, a mother of a king, the queen mother actually had more prominent and important role than the king's wife in both Israel and surrounding nations. Here's the elaboration point. This is taken from the Hebrew Discourse Bible. It says elaboration. That's what the parentheses and that phrase in the parentheses is. It's a clause or a phrase usually consisting of a particle or an infinitive that expands on the action of the main verb of which it depends. Elaboration is also used to mark utterances which are grammat grammat grammatically incomplete due to the omission of some phrase which it is to be inferred from the previous clause. In other words, elaboration always follows the clause it modifies. It's there to tell you that that particular parenthesis is modifying what the king said. So the queen had an influence on a decision given to Nehemiah. So tell me, the queen mother who was Artaxerxes' mother? I'll tell you who. Esther. Esther was his mother. He was, she was the stepmother of Artaxerxes and she was the mother of Darius. So what you have there is this. You have the queen, the king saying something, and then the queen going through, and the king thinking to himself, well, hold on. This is something dodgy going on here. This is possibly an ulterior motive. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, you've got a queen 
that has an influence as to what's going on. And it would have greatly respected his mother. Now, that is my view on that. But I don't see any other alternative and it actually fits perfectly because when you look at you look at Artaxerxes and you look at Xerxes or Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus only reigned 22 years, very short-lived, and then he was killed. Now, if Esther was in her adolescence, and let's say we take it the extreme of adolescence and she was 19 years old, from 19 going to 22 years, she would have only been in her early 40s at this period which makes her a prominent figure and an influence on the king's decision. So we go from a situation where the king is doubting, is this some ulterior motive here, to all of a sudden going, how long will your journey be? And then, yes, he's pleased. He's pleased to let me go. And I believe the influence is there in the parentheses. He's going to do the work of the God of heaven. The God of heaven that Cyrus the Great said, let all men tremble and fear before the God of heaven. Who? Lives in Jerusalem, the holy city. That's where he's going. Oh, oh okay. You know, all good. You're going to get your house in order. You are my chief cupbearer. Oh, by the way, and while you're there, Perhaps just like Reb Shachai, you can put my house in order over there and make sure that there is accommodation being built there because that was part and parcel of what Nehemiah did. The message for us, once again, if God is for us, who can be against us? No one. So, what is Nehemiah going to do now? And you'll have to wait two weeks to find that out. <laughs>